Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Paul. It's nice to be back after a couple of weeks in Uganda. Uh, one week it has taken me to recover from the 11 hour time difference. It's been brutal. I've been sleeping odd hours and normal hours and just lots of hours. But um, I'm fully prepared today and really interested in our show today because I believe there's a lesson for everyone in this episode. My guest, Richard Ward, and I plan to discuss how to plan for the future in your life, whether you are 20 years old or 70 years old. First of all, Richard Ward is an an expert in his field. He is a certified financial planner with a passion for helping people find their purpose in life. Richard believes that the secret to living life well and leaving a legacy is found by making contributions to our communities that help other people prosper. With more than 35 years of industry experience, Richard offered, or Richard believes in a holistic approach to creating a financial portfolio that offers fulfillment and possibility. A published author, Richard's book, Redefining Retirement, Finding Purpose and Passion for Your Second Half, is filled with stories of people who have found their new purpose and passions for the second half of life. Although to, today Richard works primarily with uh, retired business executives, I have found his thoughts to be highly applicable to people of all ages, uh, addressing the ever-so-troubling question, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? So what do you say? Let's begin. Richard Ward, welcome to the next chapter with Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. Good to be here. It's good to have you here. You know, your expertise is right in line with the objective of this podcast, which is what do you plan to do in your next chapter in life? And we're talking your next chapter. Right. We all have one or more, and it's important to talk about it and think about it. Yeah, we have one or more, that's for sure. Yeah, as, as I will say later, I've, later, I've probably had six or seven careers, so I've, I'm in the or more section. Yeah, most books have more than one chapter, and I think we all get them as well. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in reading, I found that you were fond of using the phrase, what do you want to do when you grow up? Uh, can you tell me what you're t- talking about when you're talking to adults on that? Right. Uh, I think everybody remembers being asked as a child, you know, what do you want to do or what do you want to be when you grow up? And we had our answers of being a fireman or policeman or some exciting field. Of course, most of us didn't go into that ultimately, but uh, we did progress through life and look forward to uh, becoming something and doing with our lives. But, you know, we get to ask ourselves that question throughout our life. I know a lot of people don't. Uh, They get a little stuck in their routine in their life as it's been for some time, and they don't really look up and they don't really think about it a whole lot. But whether you're um, um, just starting out or uh, adolescent, middle age, uh, an empty nester, or going into retirement, you really do have the prerogative of asking, you know, what are you going to do when you grow up? And you get to answer that question, and you get to look forward to something really great that you get to do uh, in the years ahead. And I think everybody ought to look forward to the next chapter in their life and what they're going to do next. I so agree, and, and and I think so many of us get stuck, especially especially during the days when we have a family, and we're raising kids, going to school, doing sports. You know, we're we're interested in raising a good family, having close knit relationships with our children, with our with our spouses, and we forget about what are we going to do in the future. What is and, and we get stuck in our job. Um, my, my first real question comes from your really what I considered an intriguing bio. And you say that you have a passion for helping people find their purpose in life. Tell me about that passion. How did that, how did that come about? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, as you mentioned earlier, um, a lot of years, I won't mention them again, in the financial services industry. Uh, My role as a financial planner was to help people become secure enough financially so that they could retire, quit their job, and and, uh, do whatever they wanted to do. 
And unfortunately, over the years, I saw way too many people who got to that point in life and did retire and really hadn't thought about the next chapter, and they really didn't know what to do. And, of course, as you know, most people take some cruises, and they learn to play golf, and they visit with their grandkids and that kind of thing. Um, But in many cases, uh, that's about it, and there's really a lack of purpose in their life. And I found that uh, way too many who uh, followed that path became a little disconnected, bored, and and even headed downhill quickly because they just didn't have new ways to contribute in their life. And the more I saw that, the more I wondered if that was really the future that I wanted for myself, let alone my clients and others. And, and I really had to rethink that, uh, that uh, scenario. Um, I did have the opportunity, however, uh, as it was, to have been a community volunteer for a lot of years. And so I had learned through my own participation with different organizations how great it is when you're helping others learn and grow and thrive. And so... Uh, I recognize that some of the really great rewards come when you're, you're participating in that way. And I did it a number, number of different organizations. I also how, had, how, Let me ask sure. you first, how old were you when you started participating with other organizations? I was in my uh, 30s, I think it was, when oh, I started. Oh, so you were young. Relatively. Um, I don't know if it was unusual or not to, to uh, get involved with a community organization. Uh, I started with an alumni group and... Uh, help raise scholarship money for students to get an education like I got. I thought that was a, a great start. I uh, worked for a number of years with the new Performing Arts Center and, and exposed kids and others to the performing arts, and, and it was great to see kids get ter- excited and turned on by something new that they hadn't experienced before. And um, later on, I uh, was able to, to witness how great it is uh, when a disabled adult got his first paycheck because of the job training skills he got through Goodwill Industries here in, in Orange County. So I really got to see firsthand over those years uh, how people uh, really benefit from this kind of uh, opportunity. And I don't mean just the, the people getting the paychecks or, or the experiences, but also the donors, the, the volunteers who are helping these folks. Um, they get great rewards by participating in this area and seeing the benefit of uh, their efforts. So that was really uh, uh, instrumental in my development. I also got to hear from some very experienced business people. <clears throat> One particular program I attended <clears throat> was with a number of people who uh, were very uh, successful in their businesses, but they got to a point in life, as they described it, where they were really not as fulfilled any longer with just doing another deal or making some more money, and they had been on a search. They were on a search for what was going to be fulfilling for the future and for the rest of their lives, and I heard them talk about how they had uh, discovered ways to use their skills, their business uh, uh, success and experiences to uh, get involved and make a real difference in the lives of other people. Uh, One was an organization that uh, a home builder had founded here in Santa Ana to help build homes for people that had needs in that area. And it became so successful and and, uh, so impactful for him that he went off to do that in Africa as well. I don't know if it was in Uganda, Charlie, but it was in other parts of Africa. He uh, took this mission and, and started doing that work. The long and short of it was that I heard some really powerful stories, and I thought it was the coolest thing I ever heard, was that people were actually taking their experiences and skills and resources and repurposing them, uh, getting involved with something new and different that was really meaningful for them. And it had a great impact on their their family's life and their life for the rest of of their years. And I thought that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to help other people uh, find these kind of answers as well for that part of their life, and so that rather than enable them to sit around and get old fast in retirement, I could actually help them find what was going to bring the next uh, source of purpose into their lives, what was going to help them continue to grow and evolve for the rest of their lives. And I thought that was a pretty good course for them, and it was probably going to be a pretty good course for me as well as I went through my uh, the rest of my career and on. That was, um, I find the same thing when I'm working with Wells of Life, that there are, working with the charity, um, charities are filled with compassionate people with not a whole lot of business experience, enough t- to take the charity to a certain level, but as the charity grows and hockey sticks, it starts needing more and more administrative um, business acumen involved. And and as I begin to work with Wells of Life, you know, that's one of my roles is to work with our CEO, who is quite adept at at doing this, and the two of us together work on it. But, you know, one of the most exciting things is when we do, every August, we take a donor trip. And people donate $6,000 for a well, 
gives water to a thousand people for 20 years in rural Uganda. So, and these are people who are drinking water that you wouldn't put your finger in. That the that the water they're drinking, they all have diarrhea. They all have some kind of um, um, waterborne disease. And when you go to a village after you have given donated to them and given them, and they had, they now own the well, we don't own the well. The excitement that you see on their face is life changing. You are never the same. They they give you gifts of chickens and pineapples. They give you actually a chicken. We never figure out what to do with the chicken, but but they they will give chickens. They will do dances. They will do songs. And it is so enriching to see what you get when you give. Yeah, I I can't say in my uh, volunteer career I've been given a chicken, Charlie. (laughs) But I can tell you that uh, you do get those rewards. I mean, to see and hear the uh, uh, descriptions of how people have gotten a start in life or how they've gotten uh, the opportunity to do something new and and what they've done with that is, is so rewarding. And that's the point. And that's the real benefit to people. It's what generates this sense of purpose in one's life. And it's really something that I want more and more people, uh, certainly my clients and others, to experience if they get the chance. Because once they do, they won't give it up. You know, you wrote, because I'm catching from what you're saying here, and that you you wrote that you believe that uh, the secret to living life well and leaving a lasting legacy, which we'll talk about later, is found by making contributions in our communities that help others. So are are you then, it seems to me you are suggesting that our purpose in life really is to serve other people, not to be self-serving. Well, I believe that, certainly. Um, look, we all need to take care of ourselves and, and put food on the table and take right. care of our families, that right. kind of thing. And and that's one of the primary responsibilities I have when I'm helping people with their financial plans, certainly. Uh, but I really believe that we evolve from success to real significance in our lives when we are changing our focus from our needs to really helping other people. That's when we earn those rewards that you were describing there. Uh, that's when we get our chickens. Uh, we get the opportunity to really make an impact in the lives of others, and that's where meaning is often found. I'm not going to say for everybody all the time that's the only place that they can find some right, purpose right. in their of life. Of course not. But course for not. so many, I think it really is a great place for them to find it. And if they don't know where to find those rewards, that's a great place to start looking because there's so many opportunities and so many places that they can be uh, useful and, and give of themselves. Uh, yeah, and just and you don't have to go to Africa. It's just in our That's local right. communities. That That's right. Just... Right here in Orange County, there's lots of needs. There's lots of great organizations that are doing terrific work. Lots of places for people to donate some time, some expertise, and of course some money if they have that. Yeah, money always helps. It always helps. <laughs> <laughs> it's it it's 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 yeah. It, it always helps. You know, something I quote frequently is from Aristotle, and Aristotle wrote that the Purpose, a person's purpose in life is to contribute to the value of society. Now, I don't even know how long. That, that was like 3,000 years ago, right? Twenty-five, Maybe 2,500 years ago. You weren't around then, were you? And, um, I'm old, but not quite that old. Um, and I think, you know, in, it occurs to me, it occurs to me, Richard, in our, in our polarized society, that we are so polarized that we that this could be something that's bringing us together as we're, as we're thinking about serving and about what it really means to take care of the disenfranchised and, and the people in diff- difficult situations. Don't you think that would really I, help bring us you know, together? I think that's a great point. It's not something I've given a lot of thought to, but now that you bring it up, it, it is very true. You know, I serve on a few boards and, and committees and that type of thing where we get together and work on these issues and these kind of problems. And, of course, there are diverse people from different backgrounds that have different thoughts and different emotions. I'm certain they have different uh, political views uh, about what should go on in in the future. But, you know, that doesn't really come up in those environments. Uh, In that case, where we are, we're working on the problem, working on the issue. We're bringing our best efforts to the table and trying to help out. And that's the focus, and that's really what we get into. And it's very rewarding to work with talented people like that who want to contribute. 
and uh, you know you can leave the politics till after work someplace in the bar yeah, I suppose yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and, and the more we you know we the more we humanize this thing the more that we're talking about dealing with people and people's real life that it just is is so empowering and so encouraging when you have an opportunity when you're given an opportunity to, to serve and and to offer assistance in somebody's life you know i talk quite frequently in this podcast on uh, about richard rohr and his book falling upward and he talks about first half of life and first half living and second half living and first half living is about intentionally and it's okay it's about building the ego and that's giving us self-esteem giving us self-confidence giving us the ability to do it but second half is then taking that ego and giving it away and and giving it to other people and and being transparent and not being so focused on myself that I'm focused on other people and other situations. I'd say that's right. I think that that pretty much describes the route that most of us are on. Obviously, young people get involved with helping organizations and volunteering oh, as well. Oh, yes. But but you're right. We go through the first half of life. Bob Buford called it uh, life one and life two, really, and oh, uh, in his book he? Halftime, uh, yeah. yeah, that many people are familiar with. But life one, we're learning about how to take care of ourselves and our needs and our families and that type of thing. Uh, and life two is really about how we are serving others and helping uh, make the world a little bit better. And unfortunately, there's no university for that. Yeah, there's no university for that at all. That is not... That's not talked about in in universities. Um, I I think, you know, it it becomes more apparent. Now, I was going to say it becomes more apparent as you grow older. As you grow older, this this becomes a stronger emphasis in your life. However, I see so many millennials that I meet are really interested in service, that that they're really interested in helping other people. I know in... Our organization, half our organization in the United States are millennials. They're 25 to 30 years old, and they, that, they, they may be too young to be millennials. They could be Gen Zs, I think they're calling them. Uh, I think they're still millennials uh, if they're 25 or 30. I've got a couple of those myself. Um, uh, but whatever we call them, you're right. They are uh, pitching in and helping out and um I don't know if they're born with that, uh, if that's where that came from, or um, they were uh, modeled that by their parents and uh, others in the community around them. Um, I'd like to take a little credit for that, maybe, you know, if, if we can in the boomer generation think that we raise millennials to, uh, to see that and experience that. But they definitely are getting involved at a young age, uh, a lot more so, I think, than, than our generation did uh, when we were that at that point. Yeah, we were. I was protesting. <laughs> <laughs> I was. A, I was a hippie. Some of us were doing doing something else, but it wasn't that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my son, like like your children, my son is very involved in charity and philanthropy, and it's a it's a big issue in his life. Um, also, in in the essay that I that I read that you had written, I really especially agree with a comment that you made that we move through the through life with a series of choices about our future. I think that is so important that we have these series of choices, but we don't we don't really recognize choices. You know, we get as we said, we get stuck somewhere and we don't recognize that there are alternatives. There are other things we do. What do you what do you suggest to people in searching out those other alternatives, searching out our series of choices? Well, I'd say first and foremost, if they're searching, they're uh, one step ahead of a lot of others who aren't <laughs> searching, you know, because people do get stuck. They uh, do the same routine for, for so many years and really haven't thought about it. Um, but you're right. You know, again, as we go through life, we'll have different life events. We'll have different stages of our lives and so forth. And each one of them is one that allows us to think about the future a little bit more and uh, address what we want for our life in the years ahead. And and it's something that I think is healthy and rewarding and and very positive to look forward to. If you get the chance to think about what it's going to look like uh, when I have a family, what it's going to look like 
when uh, my kids are out of the house? Uh, what is it going to look like as I get ready for retirement? What is my life going to look like? How do I want to live it? What's going to be fulfilling and rewarding to me at that point? And we should continue to ask ourselves that question that I uh, playfully called, uh, what do you want to do when you grow up? But, but we get to ask ourselves that question, and we get to answer it however we want. And if we don't ask those questions, we'll probably fall into something that isn't what we want. But if we, we do, we have the opportunity to really find those rewarding areas that will be so uh, such a good answer for the purpose that we want to have as we go through life. You know, I was listening to a podcast with Debbie Millman, and she has her, her podcast is Design Matters, and she's about design, but she talks about all kinds of things in life. And she's a professor, um, an associate professor at a university, and she has all of her students write an essay that if there was no chance of failure and money were no object, what would your life look like in five years? And it's just, it's a brilliant question. It really, I, I, I've posed that to people who've asked this, and, and I just had a woman this weekend come up to me and said, you posed that question to me two years ago, and I'm now living out what I, wow. what I said I would do. But that is it. That's, don't you think it's a great way to look at it? Well, it absolutely is. And I ask people this question all the time. You know, what, what do you want to be doing? What's your vision 10, 20 years down the road? And it's amazing to me how many people have really not given that a whole lot of thought. Yeah, and I think it's important to say at least to look at if, if it were not possible, to, if failure were not a possibility, and because they're always going to come, oh, I can't do that. Oh, I can't do that. So the list gets shortened mm-hmm. to where there's not there's not a visionary aspect to it. And and we want to have a visionary aspect to it that I I, I want to do something more and something meaningful. And and I can't I can't worry about failure and I can't worry necessarily about finances. That finances, you know, at some point will play a role, but that I can dream. And I think right. it begins with a dream, don't you think? Absolutely. I heard this the other day um, uh, on the radio, I think it was. The life you lead now is the one you dreamt about before. Yeah, that's funny you would say that. I have a, I have a saying Paul is familiar with, I say, saying all the time, you are what you have been becoming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's uh, so true and, and so um, empowering, you know. We get to dream. We get to think ahead. Um, I ask all of my clients, you know, if money weren't no object, what would you be doing with your life? What would your day look like? What would your month look like? And it's, you know, one of those questions that allows them to really expand and play and think about that and really come up with answers that are going to be rewarding to them, which is the whole point. And it's encouraging to take time to actually do that. I mean, you know, you can encourage them to do it, but it's not something... They can sit down and write in five minutes. That's right. They, That's they've right. they've got to take time. You know, we we just talked the, in, in a podcast that I just published today about that. I took a silent retreat for ten days. I was six days of total silence, and it was completely about pondering my life and what's going on inside. What do I want to do? Who I want to become? Who am I? What, what's what's all about me inside and and that was I took six days to do that uh, and that's not too long uh, you know it, it takes people a lot of time and I think that's one of the reasons that they often don't do it it takes some time it takes some real effort and uh, you know in our busy lives a lot of people just have other things going on other priorities and they don't often stop to ponder that question and really think you know what what would my answer be but it's so much fun to do <laughs> it is you know it really it, you know thinking about what would i get to do so what i want to do right now is i want to take a quick break and then we are going to move on to our second half of the show cuz i've got a i'm not changing directions but i i've got an important question to ask you okay Hi there, 
This is Charlie Hedges, and you're listening to The Next Chapter with Charlie and my special guest, Richard Ward, who is a certified financial planner, but he focuses on who do you want to be when you grow up? What is what is your future like? And we've talked about that, that life is a, we have a series of choices about our future, and we need to, it's important that we take a look at our series of choices. Now, I have had, as I said, probably six or seven careers, and I move on because after after a decade I grow bored, and I and I and I have looked at I, I I've looked at choices in my life where I've been, I've managed a carpet mill, I've I have been to seminary, I was a minister, I was a consultant that dealt only with training i was a trainer and then i was a coach and and now i'm vice president of operations in a in a um, in a charity all of these are series of choices that i decided to make as i grew older doing different things and and that's really really important now the first time we met um, maybe a month ago i'm not sure uh, you asked me a series of questions about my plans for the future. And what I really like, Richard, what you do is that you, you're you a great listener and you you ask questions to find out about other people as opposed to start talking about yourself and your services. <clears throat> and the first question you asked me, I recall, had to do with what kind of legacy I intended to leave on this planet after I die or even while I'm still alive. I can be leaving a legacy while I'm still alive. Uh, talk to me about the importance of legacy. Legacy is, of course, how we're remembered oftentimes. I think that's really what we're, we're talking about. Uh, when we're no longer around, uh, how will people remember us and think of us and that type of thing, and, and what kind of impact did we make? And we all get to answer that in different ways, but many people, again, don't think about that very often. But I think when you really have the ability to ask someone, you know, what do you want to be remembered for? And they can come up with a a good answer for that, that we can work towards something that's going to be meaningful and rewarding during their lifetime, but uh, certainly for those that remember them after they're gone as well. Um, And I think that's what we all should aspire to. Um, And I'll tell you, there's a a well-known community leader that uh, is a great example of this kind of thing, Uh, a gentleman who uh, uh, has his own... uh, roofing business. He started out in that business in that industry about 30-some years ago and started it on his own and, and, um, and uh, grew it to a fairly large, successful business in Orange County. But I remember him telling me the story of, of needing to make payroll one day and, and pay his mortgage and that kind of thing. And he got a call for uh, an opportunity. And he drove out in the middle of nowhere to wherever this home was that uh, needed some help. And he found a shack in the middle of nowhere. And he thought, this just can't be it. I mean, there's just no, no opportunity here. But he drove all the way, so he knocked on the door, and a, a lady opened the door, and and uh, the smell of uh, stench just overwhelmed him as soon as the door opened, and he wanted to run away and get back in his car and drive home. But a little girl was there, also there with the mother, and and uh, said, uh, you know, are you here to help us, and so forth. And he said, yeah, well, uh, sure, I guess so, and went in with her, and the little girl, of course, immediately took him into her bedroom to show her her posters on the wall and that type of thing, and he smelled the stench a little bit even more strongly. It was mold. It was in the mattresses of the of the home and the house because, it, you know, the roof had leaked and water had gotten into the oh house and goodness. so forth. Um, but this girl was so proud of her paintings on the wall that she had done that she had to show him and looked up him and said, uh, Mr., are you going to help us? And he said, of course, yes, I'll you know help you. He couldn't turn them down at that point. Uh, he went back and uh, called up his friends in the industry, got donated uh, items, for, uh, roofing items and so forth, and went out there and himself fixed the roof on that house. And it was a transformative event for him because he went on to uh, develop uh, a little bit of a mission that, in his 
world, families were going to be safe and dry. And he wanted to keep families safe and dry. And that's Charles Antis of Antis Roofing here in, in uh, Orange County. He's well known in the community. And he's gone on to use that experience to motivate him to do more of this all the time. And he has really developed this uh, reputation of leading other businesses, even his industry association, into giving away roofing to organizations that need it. His National Association of uh, Roofing Contractors now has adopted the Ronald McDonald House chain across the country to donate roofs to those homes so that their residents will be safe and dry in those homes uh, year in and year out. But that's his influence. It's his legacy. He's creating this uh, memory of what he does, and he'll be around doing it for a long time, but that uh, he's gotten these organizations involved to be able to help other people through their business, what they do day in and day out. That's important to him. It's important to what they do, and he's made a lucrative living doing it. That's amazing. That's a great story. Um, you know, I think legacy has a lot to do with with how you will be remembered. But I know with me, uh, I know that the truth is most of us are forgotten within two dinner generations. They're, you know, we're just, we, we become nobodies. But I think even then we can still leave a legacy and we can leave a legacy through our actions. And if we have if we have taught our children love and service and philanthropy, they teach their children that, who teach their children that. So our legacy goes on. Maybe our name isn't associated with it, but the efforts, like with this, the, the roofing man, Mr. Antis. Antis, the, yeah. yeah. Mr. Antis, you know, his legacy of doing roofs, whether they remember him or not, is much less important than this work continues and it goes on and people's lives are being impacted significantly by it. Well, that's right. Um, our impact shouldn't end with our lives. Um, if we're doing this and other people are seeing it and experiencing it and learning about it, then they're going to get involved and do it as well, whether it's our children or uh, our coworkers or the people that uh, come up behind them. They'll see this uh, culture of service, learn how valuable it is, and get involved with it. And they'll teach their children to do that as well. So that legacy, you're right, can go on for many generations. Yeah, it is. There's a, in the Talmud, there is, um, there is a, a saying that two things are needed of a man, and that's to, to um, have a son and plant a tree. So your name goes on, and your efforts go on with the tree, that the tree will go on beyond you. Pretty good, uh, pretty good way of looking at that. That's yeah, right. that's a mm-hmm. that, that's a that's an I'd, I'd forgot I'd forgotten about that for about the last forty years. It just came up to me. Um, now, when we were together, you asked me a series of questions. Can you can you give me an idea of some of the other questions that you asked that you wanted to learn about me to help me understand my series of choices in the future? Well, sh- sure. I, you know, I, I think the basic one is, you know, what do you want to be remembered for? I think that's a great question to get the, the conversation started. I also ask people what their vision of their future is. So, you know, let's move ahead 10 years from now. Tell me what that looks like to you. What do you want to do with that? So you've asked two questions most people have not even thought about. And don't spend a lot of time thinking about that's true. But to me, that really gets to the essence of the person, who they are, what they're all about. And it's going to ultimately enable me to help them if I'm going to help them in any way. It doesn't really matter, uh, but I want to learn what it is about them and what the obstacles are, what's in the way of you being able to live that life and what kind of help would be useful to you to be able to, to get to that point in life so that I can understand what it is you're working on as well as what kind of help that maybe I have access to that I can Uh, maybe introduce you to or provide uh, to you so that you can move down that road. Obviously, I want to know for those that are in business what their business is, who they work with, what they're looking for there, and and how I can help them in that arena at the same time, because oftentimes they go hand in hand. But those are the key kind of questions that we get to really understand who we're dealing with here and and what they're all about, what they're looking for, what they're not, and uh, hopefully apply ourselves uh, accordingly. Yeah, they were, it was it was it was a great conversation. I don't think um, you said other than asking questions, you said a word for twenty or twenty five minutes. It was just a series of questions of getting to know me, and and we spoke earlier about basic needs of people to be heard, to be cared for, and to 
belong to something significant and you are doing all three of those in those questions. You're allowing people to be heard. You're caring about them. And then in a legacy, they belong to something significant. And, and I think that's really, that's really critical human need. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I try hard to uh, uh, not uh, be all about myself all the time. Well, I, I don't think you are. I think, I, I, I think you're an example of somebody who genuinely cares about other people. So what I want to do now is I, finally, after all of this, I want to get into your sweet spot. We haven't really talked about your sweet spot, and that is uh, dealing with opportunities for people in retirement ages. That's where you're spending most of your time now. And I know when I retired at 65, I had a terrible time. I was fraught with boredom and uselessness. Um, I'm, I was so familiar with being needed, being productive, having that full calendar to show that I'm an important person. And it was hell. And, and I think it's people like me are the ones that you're primarily, primarily focusing on today. Is, is that right? A lot of the time. Yeah. Um, obviously there are a lot of baby boomers out there and, uh, we're all getting to that point in life uh, where we're thinking about this retirement period, or in some cases not, but uh, but we ought to be in control of our future and what we want to do at that point. And uh, retirement is oftentimes the, the common thing that comes up there. Um, it's a, a really important part of one's life. And again, I think it's the first real inflection point in one's life where for the first time, we don't really have something to think of as next. You know, what's the next step in our career ladder and what we're going to be doing in those next new jobs that you talked about getting as you as you move through life. Uh, because retirement, as it's traditionally lived in the United States, is all about uh, the vacations and the, the grandkids and the playing and, golf and, and the golf. that type of thing. Yeah. You know, all fine things, but doing it for 20 or 25 years, day in and day out, can get a little routine and old. Most importantly, there's no purpose in it, really. I mean, taking care of your grandkids and raising them, if you're going to be involved with them to that level, I guess, is, a, is certainly a worthwhile purpose. But, but I'm saying, you know, if you just visit them a couple times a year and so forth, that, that there's really not a lot of purpose behind this. And that's what's missing that has generally been there for the rest of your life. And it's why people get old fast. It's why they develop health issues and head downhill. And I think the research has shown very clearly that people without purpose, without generosity in their life, uh, you know, have failing health. They live uh, a lot less longer and, and uh, really are unhappy uh, about that. And so, you know, my view is that we should change that model. And, and we shouldn't be thinking about that as a end line that we're going to now coast to uh, to uh, the end or to our passing. We ought to be looking at the next chapter of growth and development. And you do that by incorporating p- purpose. And it generally is going to be a new purpose now because the business is no longer there. So we're going to have to find something else. But we're going to have to find that purpose so that we can, can continue that growth and that development and finish our lives on the upswing rather than the downswing. How do we how do we go about that? How do we go about finding that kind of purpose? Because I know, I know people. Anytime talk we talk about purpose, people are, you know, they're 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 typically kind of at a loss on how to find that. You're right. And if you pose the question to them in exactly that way, you know, what's your great purpose in life? You're probably going to get a blank stare back <laughs> a lot of times. I know that's what I've found. Um, so we need to talk about. You know, simpler questions, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up is a little easier way of uh, talking about the future. But it's pointing out to them that they've had this purpose in their life all all this time and that without one, that it's perhaps not going to be so attractive and that they need one. And, I, you know, the first step is getting them to recognize that, yeah, I probably should have a purpose in my life so that I get up in the morning feeling good about things. Um, there's lots of answers. I don't have all of them, obviously. But I, what I have found is that if if they're willing to give of themselves to something they care about, that they can probably find a pretty good answer. And I found that in the uh, nonprofit community, these organizations that are providing help to different people and all different kinds of problems in life, whether it's education or whether it's human services or housing or whatever, that there's great opportunities out there. And if I can get the individual to talk a little bit, to think a little bit about what they care about, what causes have touched their family or been important to them, 
and then get them to recognize what they have to offer. Are they um, skilled in a particular area? You have business acumen, obviously, which is valuable to your organization. And a lot of people have skills of that type. Or they just may have time on their hands. In some cases, they have a lot of money after they sell a business and that type of thing. But what is it that you have to offer? And finally, what role do you want to play out there? What is it? Do you want to be the leader? Do you want to be the guy that's helping to guide an organization? Do you want to be the worker bee? Do you want to be the accounting expert or the marketing expert, what role do you want to play in the, in this arena? Because if we can find the answer to those three questions, we probably can find a place for you to contribute and to make an impact on the lives of other people and to feel good about that, to get the rewards of seeing how you're helping other people grow and thrive. And that's what it's, what it's all about. So I think there's lots of answers out there in that world. And we just need to, to search and, and find them. It's not always easy, and the first thing you do isn't going to always be the right thing. You know, we have to try a couple of things. But, but there are some great answers out there. And the great thing about it when we're not looking for a paycheck so much is that we get to kind of call our own shots. How many hours do you want to work? How much time? When do you want to do it? You can still take the cruise and go off and do something else for a while and come back and, and continue your volunteer work. But there's lots of answers, and you get to kind of mold that, shape that into what's really satisfying to you in your life. You know, as as people get to my age, at seventy, you know, there was a time no one lived till seventy. They lived. That's why it's, retirement was sixty five. Right. But now, you know, I'm actually thinking, what am I going to do in my eighties? Mm-hmm. And you know, and if I live to my nineties, and I look at the people in their eighties, and so many live listless lives. But the ones that don't are the ones that have a reason, have have passion. There's passion about something in their life, whether it's giving or family. I mean, I can give two totally different situations. One is I have um, a situation that I know a person very closely that at 82 has two broke two hips and is has no purpose, has no reason just no no reason for staying alive and just stays in a bed all day D- does not mm-hmm. does not try to walk does not try to do anything on the other hand we have with wells of life we have sister joan who is a who is a nun 85 years old broke a hip 1 month ago she's already walking she's and she's ready to go right right back out to work and it's just and there's a purpose because she wants to help children, women, and and all adults in Uganda. And she's she's and it's just it's a world of difference. An 85 year old woman who's got the has the spirit of a 50 year old woman. That's that's such a great point. And you know, I'm sure for those who might be listening in their 30s and their 40s, it's a little hard to to get quite as familiar with this this point that you're making but you know when you you get to your 50s and your 60s you start to think about that part of life you start to think about what we call the golden years or the retirement years and so forth and what that's going to look like for me how am I going to go through that part of life and I think a lot of the the reason a lot of boomers and others have not retired is that they look around and they see examples of those that are in their 70s and 80s and they don't like what they see. They see oh, these people man. who don't get out of bed or, you know, aren't getting out of the house at all. They're, you know, homebound watching TV 24-7, you know, type of thing. And it's not a real pretty picture of what life is going to be like and how you're going to finish your life. And you can understand why they don't want to go there. You can understand why those people don't live a long time in, in, with that kind of lifestyle. The ones who do well, that that live longer and are happier, are the ones that do have some engagement, uh, like you described. Uh, they're the ones that have purpose in their life. They know that they're making an impact on other people's lives. They have a reason to get up in the morning, and that's so critical, I think, for that. That's that that is that's so important. I have one final question for you. You are an expert and experienced financial planner. But you are also an expert in life planning. Can you tell me how the two disciplines work together? How to? What is the interaction there? Yeah, um, it took me a, a few years in this industry to really learn the lesson about this. Uh, we oftentimes get so caught up in process and what we do and how we do it day in and day out that we don't really think about you know what the real end purpose is. But the reason that 
this conversation is enjoyable to me and to others is to think about what we're going to do with that next chapter or the next chapter or the last chapter or whatever it is that we're talking about here. That is the end. It, it's what we're, our purpose is, is, is to go there. It's to figure that out and to, to live it. I do financial planning for people, and there's lots of good people out there that do. But what I really think is important about this is to really understand what it is that people want to do uh, with their lives, that is, uh, what the future holds for them. Um, money and financial advice and that type of thing is a means to the end. It's not the end. Accumulating a pile of money is not the end. It's not. There's no purpose to right. that, per se. Right. It is a means to do something else. And if you want to become rich so that you can go out and help your favorite causes have a bigger impact in the world, then wonderful, terrific. I mean, that's noble. That's very valuable. Um, and however you want to live out the rest of your life, that's the ends that we're talking about. But I can't do good financial planning for people if I don't know what the ends are, what they want to do with the rest of their lives, how they want to live it, because that's the point. And when we get to that point, we all have that clear understanding, and the client shared it with me, and we've gone back and forth, and we've worked on the answers, and we've come up with that future plan together. Then we can provide the tools to make that work. And sometimes that's very important because, after all, they do still need to take care of themselves. They still need to take care of their families and the things that they are going to do for them, the promises they've made to those uh, individuals, and some of those causes that they want to help. And they all take effort. They take thought. They take sometimes real significant resources to uh, be able to do. So even uh, the the middle-level executive who wants to uh, retire and volunteer down at the uh, school day in and day out needs to make sure his bills are paid so they can go down and volunteer every day. And it's as simple as that sometimes. And it could be much more complex, of course. But the point is the means should support the end, and that's what I think is most important. And I think we all can have a great conversation around what the ends are. The means will take care of themselves. I, you know, th- that's a great way to close, and I, and 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 I think that is a extremely important point to make. That money is merely a means; it is not an end in itself. And and too much in America, we think of it as an end in itself. Mm-hmm. The possessions, wealth, all of that are the end in mm-hmm. themselves, but they are the means to something even greater. And that is, as Aristotle said contributing to the value of society and people. Richard Ward, thank you so much for joining me today. It's just, you've been a delightful guest on the show. Thank you, Charlie. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, And I want to give a hearty thank you to all our listeners for tuning in to The Next Chapter with Charlie. And be sure to check us out at our website, thenextchapter.life. And until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now. (laughs) 